really pleased to be invited because I do think this centenary is a really important centenary. And I am sometimes worried. I, I myself attended the memorial in Brighton on Sunday that it sometimes appears as a kind of celebration of war. And particularly when you're talking about the First World War, this was a really senseless war. And it did produce the ills of the 20th century. So like you just said, I mean, I think 20 million people were killed in the First World War and somewhere between 50 and 70 million were killed in the Second World War. And so when you asked me, is war legal? I said, well, I've actually written a book about it. So I'm going to tell you what's in the book. And I don't usually do PowerPoints because I think people concentrate more if you don't. But actually, law is a bit complicated. <laughs> and so I thought it was easier to do a PowerPoint in order to really think about um, whether or the answer to the question war is legal, which I am going to answer, but I'm going to take a whole lecture to answer. And the first point I wanted to make is that after the Second World War, the United Nations was established. If the First World War wasn't the war to end all wars, most people felt the Second World War was the war to end all wars. And in the United Nations Charter, uh, war was prohibited in Article 51. And in the preamble to the establishment of the UN, it says that the UN is founded to end the scourge of war. But at the insistence of nation states, there were two exceptions. One was the self-defense exception, and the other was the exception that the use of force is legal if authorized by the UN Security Council, which, as you probably know, consists of what were then the great powers, the US, Russia, France, England, and China, Britain and China, and then a few others by rotation. And they can authorize the use of force. So these exceptions uh, were allowed for. And as we go through, I'll tell you why it is that we find both the United States and Russia increasingly expanding the meaning of these exceptions. So I think the big problem we have is that international law as it now stands was largely constructed around what I call old wars. In fact, it was largely constructed around the wars of the 20th century, and the wars of the 19th and 20th century. And the problem is, as I shall explain, contemporary wars are very different. <laughs> and international law just doesn't fit contemporary wars. The result is two different sorts of development. One development is that what you'll see is that those powers engaged in war have really stretched the meaning of international law um, in very different and very dangerous ways. The kinds of things that we have seen in Syria ought to be all against international law, the bombing of schools and hospitals, beheadings, drone attacks, which are really targeted assassinations. But language has been found to justify, in legal terms, all these different frightening exceptions. And I will tell you about them as we go along. Um, but the other development is that we have had the growth of international human rights law. And that's an extremely positive development. And actually, if you start thinking in human rights terms, war is in fact a violation, a massive violation of human rights. So there's a real contradiction between war and human rights. And I feel the solution, which I'll come to at the end, is very much about emphasizing human rights law. And that's why I talk about human security. And I'll explain what I mean when we come to that point. So I'm just going to tell you something about contemporary wars, some why contemporary wars are so different from the wars of the 19th and 20th century. And I'm thinking of Syria, Libya, 
Congo, Somalia, South Sudan, Afghanistan. These are the wars of today. And what I think is really different about them is I would argue they have a different kind of logic. The 19th and 20th century wars, and even the civil wars of the late 20th century, were very much deep-seated political contests between two sides, in which each side tried to win. And these are the wars that are analyzed by Clausewitz, who's one of the most famous strategists of war. And he made the argument that wars always tend to the extreme. Uh, because each side tries to win, the politicians try to gain their objectives, the generals try <coughs> to defeat their opponents, uh, hatred and passion is unleashed among the people. And so these kind of deep-seated contests of wills, which he described, had a tendency always to become more and more extreme. And maybe the ultimate expression of Klaus Witzian war were the First and Second World Wars. But contemporary wars, sometimes I call them mutual enterprises. Sometimes I call them really a social condition. It's almost like a new ism. And rather than tending to the extreme, they tend to persistence. They go on and on and on. And they're incredibly difficult to end. And why is this? Well, I'll just very briefly tell you about what are the differences between the wars, the old European wars, and even the old civil wars and contemporary wars. I mean, the first thing is the actors. In old wars, the actors were soldiers. They were acting on behalf of the state. And even in the civil wars of the 50s and 60s, the rebels behaved like a sort of state in waiting. And they were organized hierarchically, and they, by and large, wore uniforms and um, they were, had a very strict command structure. Uh, what you see now is really networks of state and non-state actors. Some people say they're non-state actors, but actually very often, for instance, the Syrian government doesn't want to use its army on the ground because they're afraid these soldiers don't want to fire on their own citizens. So they've created masses of militias all over the country. <laughs> and they're supported by Hezbollah, which is the Lebanese Shiite militia. So you just see, or, or even the US in its attack on ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, uh, they do the bombing. And on the ground, they have a combination of Kurdish Peshmerga, Shiite militias, these kinds of groups of people, occasionally with special forces from the US or the UK, but basically they don't use regular forces on the ground. So that's, so it's, a, and, and these networks tend to be horizontal, they tend to be international and local, they tend to be global, lots of mercenaries, jihadists, all kinds of different people from abroad, and uh, they're often very loosely organized, which is possible now with mobile phones. <laughs> you don't need quite such a clear command structure. So those are the actors. Then the goals, the goals tend to be very much about, I usually say about identity, and that could be ethnic identity, it could be religious identity. But it's a funny sort of identity, and to explain what I mean, you could take the example of Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland is a conflict between Catholics and Protestants, but it's not like in the 17th century when it was an ideological conflict about breaking the power of the church and about the role of the individual and the individual's relationship to God. It was really about ideas. This is about who was born where in Belfast and who gets access to the state. So it's about the label of being a Catholic and a Protestant, not about the substance. You can't suddenly change sides by being converted. And you see the same thing, and, and I think the key thing about these identities is that they are always 
to some extent constructed. I mean, most of us have multiple identities. Most of us think, you know, are we, which some, a big problem we have with Brexit, are we English, British, um, whatever? And we don't know European, whatever we are. Both, most of us have multiple identities. When one identity matters more than others, it's usually linked to violence. Because if somebody wants to kill you because you're a particular identity, that identity becomes incredibly important. And you, what you see it in almost all the conflicts I've studied, Northern Ireland, Syria, uh, Bosnia, before the war, people would say, well, we never had any problem, most of us are mixed. And then suddenly, during the process of the war, these identities become more important. You see it now in Syria. Everyone in Syria will tell you they were mixed identities. But the Shiite, Sunni identity has become really important as a consequence of the violence. And I think the other thing, that the next thing that is incredibly different is tactics. Contemporary wars, in a way, evolved out of the civil wars of the 50s and 60s. After the Second World War, no one wanted battles between conventional forces. They were simply too destructive. So ways had to be found to get around this. And the revolutionaries, uh, like Mao or Che Guevara, had the idea that the way you win is through political control rather than through military control. But you use your force to wear down the enemy. So they used hit and miss tactics. But in the end, they thought, and they tried, they created safe havens and tried to create model communities in which they had the support of the people in their safe havens. But and in the end, they thought they would win politically. The regimes would topple. They didn't expect to win militarily. So it's not about capturing territory militarily. It's about capturing territory politically. But what happened was that you then developed counterinsurgency as a way of countering the tactics of the revolutionaries. And what they tried to do was to undermine the relationship of the people to the revolutionaries, and they used all sorts of techniques, forced displacement, the British did that in Malaya, creating strategic hamlets where they literally moved the population. The Americans used herbicides in Vietnam to make, so the people's crops would die and people would be forced to move. Um, Brit Kitson, who's a very famous person in British counterinsurgency his, history created what were known as, um, what were they called, quasi-gangs, pseudo-gangs. That's what he did to fight the Mama, creating local people who had these kinds of tactics. And that's what I think morphed into new wars. The typical tactics are that you seize the administrative building and you get political control by expelling everybody who challenges your political control through all sorts of means, including deliberate sexual violence, including destruction of cultural heritage, uh, including committing really horrible atrocities and then showing it on the internet so everyone will be frightened and run away. Um, and so, the, this is, these are tactics in which you avoid battle and the violence is deliberately against civilians. And then finally, another big difference is the economy. I mean, everyone will remember Rosie the Riveter and the way in which in old wars everyone participated. Uh, women were dragged in to produce armaments, both in the First and Second War. They were totalizing, mobilizing, or target. These wars are completely the opposite. They occur in countries where unemployment's very high, participation's actually low, taxation's very low. Um, they've usually been subjected to neoliberal economic policies. And so they have to find other ways to finance themselves. And the ways they finance themselves is through violence.
So it's through loot and pillage, through kidnapping, hostage taking, extortion at checkpoints, um, very uh, taxing humanitarian aid. Many of these groups will deliver the humanitarian aid because it's too dangerous for the Western aid agencies to go in and they'll take a big cut. Um, and very importantly, smuggling. Every war seems to have its own special kind of commodity that they smuggle in, um, in, in, in the Balkans. It was people cigarettes and alcohol, in Afghanistan it's drugs, in Syria it's oil and antiquities. And you reach a certain point when you start to wonder, is the point of the war, this econ you know, the disorder that provides a cover for criminality, or is criminality a way of financing the war? And that really brings me to my point about the logic of persistence, because the problem is that these groups can only reproduce both their political and economic positions through violence. Uh, since their finance depends on violence, they have to keep going. And their politics, actually, this extremist identity politics depends on violence too, and that's why they're so difficult to end. Anyway, that's my little lecture on new wars, but I needed to explain it in order to show how completely inapplicable is international law as it was constructed in these contexts. But before I do so, let me just say a little bit about what is international law. I mean, I think what one should say is it's, um, oh gosh, I... It's a discourse, it's a way of communicating among states and providing the rules under which states relate to each other. Um, I've, I've, I've mentioned too, it, it, it's what they've agreed, either through common law or through treaties. And it's very much how it works, how it's implemented, very much depends on the community of lawyers and the shared understandings among different groups and you know in the past this was purely states but nowadays many other people are involved in lawmaking international agencies global civil society you know international NGOs multinational corporations and the result is that you get sort of competing communities with competing ideas of what international law consists of. And if I had longer, I'd describe that at greater length. But I think two key issues. is in. It's often said that international law is different from domestic law because it lacks enforcement. In domestic law, we have courts, we have police. Actually, we're having more of that in international law. We look at the debate now about the European Court of Justice and its role. There are many more courts now in international law and there is more implementation. But I think, in fact, domestic law rests on assumptions that people make much more than it does on implementation. It's because we, we obey the law, not because we're afraid of going to prison. I mean, going to prison is a symbol of what happens when you don't obey the law. It's, it reinforces the norms, but we basically obey the law because we think it's right. <laughs> And very often, you know, if people consistently break a law, like, I don't know, smoking marijuana, you end up legalizing it. So we, you know, we do believe. But where I think there is a difference between international law and domestic law is that international law, as it was constructed in the 19th, 19th and 20th century, is very much about the laws of war. And war is, of course, prohibited in domestic law. So that's what I'm now going to talk about. That's where the real difference is, but that, I'm going to argue, is changing. So I, I just thought I'd go through three elements. I could have done more, but it's just there's such a lot to say about when is law considered legal under traditional international law. Or, uh, and the first thing is, is something called right authority. Who is allowed to authorize a war? Not anybody can say, I want to go to war. It has to be formally authorized. And in the early modern period in Europe, 
it could be authorized both by religious authorities, the Pope, and by secular authorities. So that was what brought the difference between holy war and just war. And actually, when th the weird thing about it is that a, a king could authorize war, but then he had to abide by chivalric law and canon law. So there were really strict rules about when the king could authorize the war. But if the Pope authorized the war, like with the Crusades, you could do anything because the Pope hadn't told you. And you know, one of the explanations as to why the Crusades were so bloody is because it was authorized, they were authorized by the Pope and not by secular authorities. And interestingly, in Islam, you don't have this same distinction between holy war and just war. Because the Pope was meant to be the voice of God, whereas nobody except um, nobody except Muhammad actually knows the voice of God in Islam. <laughs> so it's up to everybody how they interpret it, which is why there's only just war. There can't be a holy war because God can't doesn't speak to anybody on earth, and. A just so jihad well jihad doesn't even mean war actually it means a struggle for what's just but when people talk about fighting jihad they're actually talking about fighting just war not holy war and they go to huge lengths actually the jihadists I mean quite wrong interpretations in my view of the Quran but to try to legitimize what they do in terms of Sharia law so I think what was key, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which ended the religious wars, did something very important. It eliminated religious war. Um, it met after the tr Treaty of Westphalia, the only wars that were legal were wars authorized by sovereign states. That was the big significance of Westphalia. And really what I want to suggest is that 1945 was actually equally momentous. Really, nowadays, only the Security Council, at least technically, can authorize war. If a state does go to war in self-defense, it has to inform the United Nations immediately. So there was a really big shift from national to international authority. Uh, I think one big problem is that, of course, the Security Council consists of the great powers and is very untransparent and very unaccountable. Um, so that's a problem. But nevertheless, this is a really significant shift. Now, I just want to talk about justifications. As I said, the only exception to uh, the prohibition of war was self-defense, but it said, if an armed attack occurs. That picture is the only one I could find. It's the British pushing the rebel ship Caroline over the Niagara Falls in um, the American uh, War of Independence. <laughs> And it contained lots of weapons, and so the American, the British pushed it over the Niagara Falls with a great loss of life. And the Americans protested, and the British claimed they'd done it in self defense. And the exchange of letters between the Foreign Secretary and the American Secretary of State is now considered what counts as self defense. And the American Webster, who was the American self-defense, said, for self-defense to be justifiable, it has to be instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation. So it's quite narrow what legally counts as self-defense. But what has happened as a result of new wars? First of all, uh, the US has said that an ad immediately after 9-11, they said the US has been attacked. But it never was meant to be an attack by non-state actors. So this was treated as an attack by the United States. 
And that was the first point, that the United States then went to war in Afghanistan claiming this was a war in self-defense. They informed the Security Council that this was a war in self-defense. Had we said, no, this is not an armed attack, it's a crime against humanity, it would have involved a completely different approach based on policing, intelligence, and we wouldn't be in the mess we are today. So the first thing is treat, and this has now been expanded and expanded when you come to Syria. I mean, then the Russians said they could go to the self-defense of non-state nationals. So they gave passports to people in uh, Ossetia, in Georgia, and to people in Ukraine, and said, we've got to go to the, it was called passportization. And then they said, we've got to go to the defense of these Russian nationals because they're under attack. So that was another sense in which self-defense met. Then even more seriously, Bush said, there's such a thing as anticipatory self-defense or preventive self-defense. So actually, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, which it might use in the future. So we can go to war in Iraq to prevent Iraq from, of course we all know it never had weapons of mass destruction, but even if it had, you can't just, uh, or it, it completely contradicts the Webster definition of self-defense. So that's another sense in which self-defense has been enlarged. Then you're supposed to, when you do self-defense, there are principles of necessity and proportionality. You're not meant to do more than try to repel the attack. Uh, if you see Israel in Gaza, to be sure, Israel is being attacked by rockets, but the response is completely out of proportion to the rocket attacks on Israel. And I finally mention the Syria case. The ISIL, in, in the case of Iraq, the Americans argued that they were invited by Iraq to attack the Islamic State. But in the case of Syria, they said um, that there was an imminent threat that by non-state actors uh, to uh, Iraq. This was collective defense in self-defense for Iraq by non-state actors in Syria. And so it involved both the, the issue of non-state actors, both the, I mean, it's a very convoluted, extensive defense, and it's using self-defense so that that exception really has increasingly become completely meaningless. So self-defense is one of the problems. The second one, oh, and before I finish, let me just say something about self-defense and what I think about self-defense, because then I'll come to it all at the end which is what on earth does self-defense mean? The famous international lawyer, Grotius, who's often considered the father of international law in the 17th century, made this statement that if a man is uh, threatened in the night and there's no one near to help him, of course he's justified in killing that man. That's individual self-defense, or, or at least attacking him. Everyone agrees with that. But what does self-defense of a state mean? That is a really interesting question, especially now in a global era. It, it could just mean defense of all the individuals who live in that state. But if it means defense of all the individuals who live in that state, what is the difference between an armed attack and a crime against humanity? You know, isn't it humanitarian intervention rather than self-defense. Or it could mean that the state is an it. But what is the it that's the state? Is it a state? There, there's a, when um, the issue of the legality of nuclear weapons came before the International Court of Justice, they decided that nuclear weapons on the casting vote of the president were legal in the case of the very survival of the state. But what does the survival of the state mean? This is a really interesting question. Is it a state apparatus? 
Is it the social contract between the citizens and the state? Is it culture? Is it a way of life? And I think one of the big problems in a global era is that all these things are now internationalized. Does the European Union and the United Nations have a right of self-defense? Um, if we think about shared communities, we have so many shared communities that cross borders. How can we defend part of a shared community? So it's really difficult to know what self-defense of the state means in today's world. Um, and I think a particular problem is that if we think it's a collection of individuals, can this justify war? Because surely the enemy is also a collection of individuals. Can you actually kill, you know, it's one thing to say, um, you know, we kill, the, we, we kill the person who launched this attack, but what about the innocent soldiers on the other side? So these are all very big questions about self-defense, which I'll come back to at the end. Then the second exception, which has become increasingly important, has been the humanitarian exception. So here's again a quote from Grotius. If a ruler should inflict upon his subjects such treatment as no one is warranted in, in inflicting, the exercise of a right vested in human nature is not precluded. So, you know, surely if genocide is committed or if the Germans are doing the Holocaust or the genocide in Rwanda or the terrible deaths in Bosnia, aren't we justified in going to their help? And um, this idea became very fashionable after, this, after the end of the Cold War. Um, at, there were actually humanitarian interventions in the Cold War in East Pakistan, in Cambodia and in Uganda, but they were all justified, not as humanitarian, but in terms of self-defense. <coughs> but we got all of these interventions it, after the Cold War that were justified in humanitarian terms. And certainly after the Kosovo War, there was this international commission to look into sovereignty and intervention, and it came up with this term responsibility to protect. And in particular, the Somalia resolution of 1992 authorized all necessary means to relieve human suffering. But I think the big problem with humanitarian intervention is, can you use military means for humanitarian purposes? And Kosovo and Libya are the most explicit ones, where what was used for humanitarian purposes was bombing. And the thing is that you can't actually protect people on the ground through bombing. Um, and in both cases, you, and with bombing you risk the very lives of the people you're gonna protect. In the case of Kosovo, about two or 3,000 people were killed by the bombing. Um, it is true that at the end of the war, Milosevic caved in and all the Albanian refugees who had been expelled by the Serbs returned to their homes. So it's kind of mixed in the sense that, you know, they did manage to return their, to their homes. But nevertheless, there was this quite high collateral damage. And on top of it, it left a hatred and polarization among the Albanians and Serbs that is still very difficult to cope with today. <coughs> it left a legacy which is really problematic. Libya, well, this is gonna sound really controversial, but they did succeed in, in knocking out all Gaddafi's heavy weapons. And if you see the carnage in Syria compared with the level of carnage in Libya, it is mu was much less in Libya because in, in Syria they had, Assad regime had all it, their heavy weapons and have been able to bomb their own citizens and with the most terrible casualties. And they've had Russia, everybody's been bombing Syria. I think I counted 75 countries if you count all the coalition countries as well. And at least you haven't had that in Libya. But at the same time, the bombing attack empowered local militias because the NATO wanted to get rid of Gaddafi. Uh, 
and the result is Libya is now a very chaotic country full of militias. And of course, we don't know the scale of the casualties, um, but certainly bombing was much more precise and less likely to have collateral damage than was the case in Yugoslavia earlier, 10 years earlier. But at the same time, a lot of people were caught up in the civil war that followed. So I think the big question is, can you use military means for humanitarian purposes? And I think that's the big question. I mean, my view tends to be, and, and I'll come back to it at the end, that you can, if you do it in a very different way, if it's really about policing and protection and not about fighting a war, but that's very difficult. The military are trained to fight wars, not to protect people. So that's on the justification for war side, the two <coughs> problematic exceptions, self-defense and humanitarian intervention. But this is about how you fight wars. And in all traditions, there is, in all cultures, there are rules about how you fight wars. Somebody said war is murder. The whole point is, how do you distinguish between heroes and murderers? And so international law is hugely important because soldiers are trained not to do certain things. There are rules about how you fight wars, and they go back very long in history. And I took this example partly because it was such a nice picture. This is the Battle of the Mahabharata, which is this classic Hindu battle where Krishna made all these, there's Krishna actually, he always has a blue face, uh, made all these important statements. And as you see, the, there was a long list of categories of people that you're not allowed to kill. Women and children, the aged, Brahmins, that's religious people, and ascetics, those from whom one has received food, Drivers, transporters, drummers, conch players, foragers, camp followers, doormen, menials or servants in charge of menials, artisans such as miners, those who are beginning a sacrifice, seeking deliverance or undertaking religiously motivated fast to death. So it's a huge list. And in the Islamic and Jewish traditions, it also includes you're not allowed to cut down trees and you're not allowed to kill animals uh, because those are things that you need for life. So it's even stronger in these traditions. And in the 19th century, these, these kinds of traditional uh, traditions were codified in international law in the Geneva and Hague Conventions. And like these earlier, they were all aimed at reducing human suffering, but they were also a way you legitimated war. And it's what distinguished soldiers from murderers. Now, many of those rules were predicated on a classic international war. And the problem is none of these things applied. <laughs> so I'm just gonna tell you some of the things. So first of all, uh, the wars were supposed to be a war between state parties to international law. That mean, that's mean, means there were meant to be international wars between states. <coughs> then after the Second World War, they added the category of non-international armed conflict. But actually, it's very difficult to fit contemporary wars into non-international armed conflict because they were designed very much around the civil wars I was talking about earlier. And these, these contemporary wars are both global and local. It's really difficult to know what to call them. So they don't fit very well into the definition of conflict. Secondly, we don't know when is, when is something a war and when is it not a war. So when Assad started to shoot on his citizens who were protesting, he said it was a war, they were terrorists, but surely, Assad was subject to human rights law. He shouldn't have shot on his citizens. But if it's a war, well, that's okay, because they're, the, they're enemies. So this is a huge problem. At what point is it a war? Then, of course, 
probably the biggest point. At the heart of international humanitarian law is the distinction between the combatant and civilian. You're allowed to kill combatants, but not civilians. So these funny kinds of militias, warlords, what are they? Combatants are supposed to wear uniform and carry their weapons openly. These guys, well, they quite often dress up in peculiar clothes. They wear ski goggles, or they dress up in women's clothes, or do all sorts of peculiar things. Um, but they're not uniforms. So, you know, how do you know? And that this has been such a problem, because when the Russians kill schools and hospitals, they say, oh, well, there were terrorists inside them. So, and since they're living among the civilians, how do you know who's a civilian or a combatant? So that's the second problem. <coughs> then it's terribly difficult, and this was a problem in the Second World War. It, you know, was the Second World War fought in international humanitarian law terms? Masses of civilians were killed. You know, at what point is an attack necessary or proportional to what's to the victory you're likely to achieve. This is a huge problem. So for all these reasons, it's really, really difficult to apply international humanitarian law in contemporary wars. What we have got is two developments, especially after the Cold War, which is the rise of human rights law and the rise of international criminal law in we've got the establishment of the International Criminal Court and um, where people can be tried for war crimes, which is a great step forward. And human rights law is a great step forward. Well, of course, new wars violate in extreme ways both human rights law and international humanitarian law. The war on terror. So on the one hand, the US Attorney General says this is war. So therefore, we're justified in killing terrorists. And that's how they justify the drone attacks, for example. But on the other hand, they say, it's not war. You see, he says, this new era of terrorist activity ill fits either category of international conflict or non-international conflict. And because it's non-war, there are no clashes. He's saying all the things I've just said. But how, why does he say it? To justify the fact that the Guantanamo prisoners are not treated in the way you're meant to treat prisoners of war under international humanitarian law. So it, it's a complete contradiction, these two quotes. So it's sort of weird. On the one hand, they say, and it is just, I mean, the drone attacks are just incredible because these are targeted assassinations. They have what are called signature strikes in which they uh, take all the information they have and they put it through an algorithm and if it fits with what they think a terrorist is, they kill him. They also have double tap strikes. They kill a terrorist and then they assume that the people coming to their aid are also terrorists. So it's becoming really dangerous and this is justified on the grounds that this is a war on terror. And, but it, within international, you know, you're not meant to kill combatants except within battle and within a war zone. Targeted assassination is completely unacceptable in international humanitarian law. So it's just incredible the way war is be, law is being stretched at the moment. So this is um, <coughs> the signing <laughs> of the Bosnian peace accords. And um, I, w I, I wanted to bring it in because I think there are also problems in, uh, there's a whole new body of law around peace agreements, which are also quite problematic. What you see in front are these are three war criminals, Milosevic, Tujman, and Bekovic, I think, the president of Bosnia. Because uh, Karadzic and the local commanders weren't there. Uh, anyway, these are the three war criminals. And the basic idea was that because they assumed that Bosnia was like an old war, a political contest, 
it was all right to have war criminals sign the peace agreement. Perhaps old wars were always like that, and it was always war criminals that signed the peace agreement. But it really embedded the position of those war criminals. And what we've now got is a huge number of agreements that are signed in Africa, 647, and it's sometimes called a new law of peace. But these basically, they don't end the conflict. They just entrench the positions of the warring parties. So basically, they're kind of mafia truces legitimized by international legal arrangements. And Bosnia's the perfect case. So Bosnia's the poster child. It um, has had more aid per person than we received in martial aid after the Second World War. There have been large numbers of troops deployed in Bosnia, but yet Bosnia is still totally divided, ever-present. If you go there, it feels as though the war hasn't ended. Ever-present threat of war and very high unemployment, 40% among young people. It's a really dysfunctional society that really exists only on because of the international presence. Now, recent wars are much more difficult because one of the things that's been happening is the multiplication of armed groups. And particularly in Congo, armed groups have discovered that actually the way to get access to the state is to form an armed group and then be included in a peace agreement. <laughs> so, uh, honestly, we have evidence from our research. And it's the same. There's something called security sector reform, which means integrating the militias into a formal military and they all get ranks and salaries and we've got lots of examples of people forming armed groups in order to get a job in the military <laughs> so i'm coming to the end at last uh, what's the alternative to all this i mean it's really and we talk about, and I'm very pleased to have my friend Andy Salmon, who practiced it <laughs> in Basra, in the front row. Um, none of the approaches work in terms of ending wa these wars. Neither bombing nor peace agreements. So how do we, act? because they all assume this old war assumption. So what can be done to address these wars? And actually, I think it's... You know, I, we wrote this book three years ago, but I'm even struck by how important it is now for us. Because I think if we can't address this wars, there's a very dismal prognosis. I mean, given the developments in this country and in the United States, we are not immune from these wars. We, not only the issue of refugees, which is a huge issue, the issue of the spread of organized crime. I mean, people are not often aware of it, but the main reason for high London prices is money laundering. Buying a property in London is the best way that um, Russian oligarchs and Syrian warlords can launder their money. Um, and in fact, you can go on kleptocracy tours of London, but it's happening all over actually. It's just a way of accumulating money. Um, and then finally, terrorism. You know, we can't deal with terrorism by the continued war on terror. There wouldn't have been the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria without the intervention in Iraq and without the war in Syria. It just wouldn't have happened. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq when the war began. And now we're seeing the spread in large parts of Africa. So we can't really ignore these wars, and we have to think of how to approach them in an alternative way. And um, what, it, what does human security mean? Well, it's been defined as, it, the, the reason I called it second generation was that first generation was a big debate about what it meant. And there was a debate between those who saw it as the implementation of human rights and those who said it was much broader, it, was about, it wasn't just about freedom from fear, it was also about freedom from poverty. And there was a whole school of thought that felt that 
once the Cold War ended, the resources could be spent on solving the problems of development and that would end war. What sec I mean by second generation human security is how do you actually, if, if what you, is how do you actually implement human security? So the definition of human security is it's about protecting the individual rather than protecting borders and the communities in which they live. That's the definition. And it's about freedom from fear and freedom from want. But I think there's a third definition. Human security is what we enjoy in a rights-based law-governed society like the UK. Actually, if something emergency happens, we expect there to be ambulances, <coughs> firefighters, police ready to help us. That's how I understand human security. It's about the spread of that worldwide. I, I think there's no way in a globalized era we can defend ourselves from foreign threats. The only way we can have a safer world is through the extension of rights-based law. And that means having, if you like, global human security emergency forces. And they might include the military, but if they include the military, it's actually for protection, not for fighting an enemy. Um, so, but it involves all sorts of other things as well. Um, I mean, one of the things in Syria is, which people don't know, and it, in fact, all the conflicts I've ever studied, is that there are always places where local people try to create peace and negotiate peace themselves. People don't know that last year there were actually 44 local ceasefires. And I can give you so many examples. There's a town called Hama, which had the worst violence in the early 80s. There was a massacre of literally about 10,000 people when they had an Islamic uprising. Hama has stayed out of the war completely. And the reason is there's a family with 10 brothers nine of whom are businessmen, and one of whom is a sheikh who was in part of the opposition. And together, they negotiated both with the regime and the armed groups to keep out of Hammer. And I can give you lots more examples like that, but what those cases need is to be strengthened. They're usually ignored by the international community who focus on the armed groups. But they could be strengthened with monitors, mediators, all sorts of people, so as to try to expand safe areas and sort of contain the development of contemporary war. I, I won't mention Aleppo, but I just want to finish by saying what does it mean? How would international law need to change? Or rather, it doesn't need to change, but how would we need to interpret international law? Because most of the laws we need already exist. I mean, my colleague Christine Chinkin, um, with whom I wrote the book and who is an international lawyer, had lots of concrete suggestions which we put in the end of the book about things that would have to happen. But basically, I'm, I'm talking about how we need to think about what I've talked about. So the first thing is the key importance of international authority and a more accountable Security Council and representative. The second thing is I think we should, ha basically I think we should reconceptualize war as a humanitarian catastrophe. We should think of war as a massive violation of human rights rather than as a contest between two sides. And what would that mean? So I've mentioned international authority. There's no meaning in self-defense. There would be a meaning, we can talk about a crime against humanity, but if we started thinking in human rights terms instead of war terms, we would come up with very different solutions. A very good example is Crimea. The Russians, as you know, took Crimea. We all, the whole international community yeah. said this is, an, this is unacceptable, um, but it was always thought of in terms of territory, never in human rights terms. Actually, what happened as a consequence of the Russians taking Crimea has been terrible violations of human rights especially in property, lots of property taken over, but, and also the discrimination against the Crimean Tartars. Mm 
But nobody talks about that because we're more preoccupied with the taking of territory than we are with human rights. And I think if you just start thinking in human rights terms, you come up with different ways of doing things. Um, and that I mean, the humanitarian exception exists, but it has to conform with, with human rights law and international criminal law rather than international humanitarian law. Although it could, I mean, international humanitarian law has lots of good things in it because it's developed over such a long time. You don't want to throw it out. You don't want to throw out that wonderful quote from the Mahabharat. But at the same time, it needs to be augmented by international human rights law and international criminal law. And, well, I didn't talk about this uh, I didn't talk about weapons law because I just thought it was too much. Uh, but the final thing is that you need peace agreements, but they need to be start from the bottom up and they need to be more like constitutional arrangements than like, form, like peace agreements from above. And then finally, so what's my conclusion? My conclusion is war is illegal if we take human rights law seriously if we only stick to the laws of war and don't take seriously human rights law, then we can make a case. But if we do think that the development of international human rights since the end of the Second World War is significant, then war is illegal. <laughs> so that's, I've, I've now come to the end of this lecture.